It's good to be with y'all tonight. I have to keep wiping my head. I've got, I was told I was bleeding, and apparently I'm bleeding pretty decent, so it'll be all right, though. I want to invite you, if you will, to turn with me tonight to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I want to, I want to start out asking you this question. Do we believe that whatever God has called us to do, that He will supply us with the strength, the practical wisdom, and the resources to accomplish what He's called us to do? You know, that's something I want us to think about here. You know, we're going to be looking tonight in the Gospel of, of John. We're going to be looking at the second half of chapter 10 and verses 22 through 39. And, you know, the setting of this is, is the Feast of Dedication. And Jesus here, He's... he's coming to the end of his public ministry. And this feast was uh, to memorialize the cleansing and the, and the rededication of the temple under Judas Maccabeus, who has freed the Jews in the Greek occupation back in 164 B.C. Now, this, this feast symbolized, was symbolized by a celebration of lights. And, and typically, the, the lights were in the temple, but here we see that, that in, the, in this scripture tonight and in this story, these lights were... Uh, were lit in each house, you know, as, as part of Hanukkah is what they call it now, uh, but they weren't in the temple. So it, was, it, it, was, it wasn't a celebration that pointed to the past, but it was a celebration that pointed to the future hope for a time when the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would, would come and, and He would come to the temple and He would establish, as Judas Maccabeus had anticipated, a time of freedom from oppression and of independence from each person and each family that was in that time there. And so as we look here tonight in John chapter 10, we're going to start reading in verse 22. The Bible says, Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. <clears throat> the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. I and the Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones against him to stone him, and Jesus answered them, Many good works I have, have, I have done or shown you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus answered them, <clears throat> It is not written in your law, I said, you are God's. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. I do not do the works of, I do not do the works of my Father. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought against, again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. Father, we thank you for this beautiful night that you've given us. And God, we thank you for the, the, that the storms that they moved past this afternoon and we didn't get what they thought we was going to get. And Father, we just, I, I just praise you for that. And <clears throat> Lord, I just pray tonight as, as we gather here together. And Lord, we just join our hearts and our minds together, Lord, to hear your word. I pray that you would just control my mouth and use me as your mouthpiece, Lord, and that you would just speak the word through me as your vassal, God, to, uh, for what we all need to hear tonight. And I just thank you for this word that you've given us, Lord. I, I needed to hear this message myself uh, this week. And so, Lord, I, just, I pray that you would just be glorified in all the things that are said and done. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here in the scripture tonight, Jesus, here he is, he's, he's talking with these religious Jews in this passage. And as we read through this account, uh, we see that it's not an, an unusual situation. It's not something that's, that's uncommon for these Jewish religious leaders to, to come to Jesus and to question him about uh, his teachings and about his authority and especially about his deity. You know, they questioned him several different times throughout the scriptures on all these things. And, 
You know, so when it, whenever I was writing this and, and, and praying over this and working on the sermon this week, and as I read through the scriptures, I began to just pray and I asked the Lord, I said, what is it that you want, want me, but you want all of us to see and, and learn through this passage? You know, what is it that you're saying uh, to us as your people and as your church? You know, and, and I, I pray that instead of just simply talking about what the passage is relaying, I, I want us to look and, and I want him to convey through me tonight, you know, how we can apply this to our lives in a, in a practical way. And as I studied through this, I, I noticed that there were three things that I could see in this passage. And number one is the importance of taking responsibility. Number two, the importance of understanding our security. And then number three, the importance of seeing the obvious. And so first of all, I want to talk about the importance of taking responsibility. You see, John tells us uh, that this encounter took place in wintertime at the Feast of Dedication. And here Jesus was. He, was. he was walking around in the area of Solomon's porch when all of a sudden these, these religious Jews and these religious leaders, they, they come up to him and, this, and they came only to interrogate him. You know, that's all they wanted to do. They were, they were trying their best to find uh, anything that they could co come against Jesus with. They were trying to question him and, and, and not to discover the truth about him or to, or to help him to decide whether to, uh, if they was going to follow him or not. What they were doing is they wanted to find some reason that they could arrest Jesus and have him put to death. And that's the only reason that they came to him at that time. But we see here in verse 24 uh, of the scripture that we read earlier, it says in verse 24, it says, Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, then tell us plainly. So here, here, here he is, you know, they, they come to him and they, they ask him this question and, and they essentially were asking him, you know, if you really are, or if you really want us to know who you are, then tell us, just tell us, you know, don't keep us in suspense. We, we just need to know the truth and make it clear to us so that we'll know what to think. So see here on the, on the, surf of the, on the surface of this, it, it looked like that they were willing to open up and believe in, in what Jesus was saying. It, it, it looked like they were going to believe, you know, if, if only Jesus would just openly tell them and be honest with them and, and tell them the truth of who he really was. You know, but I love Jesus' answer here that he gives in, in verse 25. He, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works I do... <clears throat> that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So he's telling them, he's like, guys, listen. He said, I've not only told you uh, through my teachings by who I am, I've showed you time and time again by the miracles that I have done and all the good works that I have done and all these things that I have performed, uh, these are the things that show you and give you all the verification of who I am that you need. You know, and, and they had seen all these things. They, these religious leaders, they already had enough uh, evidence beyond a reasonable bout, doubt to convince them of who Jesus really was. But see, instead of, of being reasonable and responsible for what they heard and, and acting on what they knew, they rationalized the way their teachings and his works by accusing him of blasphemy. You know, that they didn't like what he had to say. They, they were scared of what he had to say because they, I think deep down they probably knew that it was the truth. But see here, in, in reality, their minds were already made up. And, and they were going to argue their case no matter what Jesus did or, or what he said. You know, it's kind of like an old adage my granddad used to say years ago when I was a kid. He, he always said, he says, never, never explain yourself. And I always wondered what he meant by that. And, and then he would sit there for a minute and he'd say, he said, I'll tell you why. He said, your friends don't need it and your enemies won't believe it. And I, and I thought about that, you know, in this. And this is kind of the way these religious, religious Jews and these leaders were, you know. They didn't, they didn't need it. They didn't want to believe it. But we see here in verse 26, uh, we see Jesus, he kind of puts the ball back in their court with, this, with, with verse 26, telling them to take responsibility for what they had seen and heard. You know, he says here in verse 26, he says, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. You know, he, he tells them straight up, you know, that, that they're not his sheep. He said, you're not, he said, you're not Christian people. You don't believe in me. You don't believe in God. You know, so, so, so you're not my sheep. You don't believe in me. So my question is, what about us? You know, we, we may be part of, of Jesus' flock, you know, belong to his sheepfold and ask him to speak to us and to, to tell us the truth, to show us, 
His way in our, in our life. But when, when we hear a sermon or if we read a passage of Scripture in our daily study that calls us to action or to, to possibly make some type of decision or maybe to obey a command that He's called us to do, you know, to maybe stand for truth or to repent of a sin or maybe change our attitude. Sometimes we need that. Or, or sometimes it's to take a step in faith and do something that's out of our comfort zone. You know, what, what do we do with the knowledge of knowing these things? You know, what do we do when, when God calls us to these things? Do we rationalize it away or do we take responsibility when we receive the answers to these questions from the Word of God? You know, what, what, what do we do with that? You know, and are, are, are we asking Jesus questions because we really want to know who He is and, and what His will is for our lives? You know, that's a scary prayer. If you, if you really want to get God to give, tell, have God give you what He wants, I dare you to pray for what His will in your life is because He'll show you, and He'll show you in a heartbeat. And, and, and when He gives us the answers, though, here's the other question. Are we willing to act on the answers that He gives us or, or, or act on what, he, what He's told us, the answer that we've heard, or, or do we not even dare to ask because we're fearful of what the answer might be? You know, I, I've, heard, I've heard people talk about that before. I, I talked to one guy one time. He said, I never pray for what God's will is in my life because he said, I'm scared to death of what it might be. You know, and I, I'm wondering how in the world can you be scared to know what God's will is? You know, so, so we don't, you know, do we believe that whatever God has called us to do, that He's going to supply everything that we need to accomplish that task? You know, I, th I think we all face situations in our lives and we encounter difficult people, we encounter difficult situations and circumstances at times, and sometimes we have to make some painful choices. <clears throat> but are we willing to own the decisions that we make in our life, whether they're good or bad? Are we willing to, to listen to what Jesus has to say about the way things are and then, and then take personally, uh, personally take the responsibility for those actions and those things in our lives? And are we willing to do what's necessary to make the hard choices uh, when those decisions come in order to be set free and, and to live a life that God has called us to? You know, I think sometimes it's, it's a little bit easier, and I, I think a lot of people do this, I think sometimes it's easier to play the victim of the situation, to blame others, to blame a family member, to blame a friend, to blame our, our job, our boss, you know, to blame, do, do whatever we have to do to blame somebody else and put it off on somebody else or, or whatever else we can do to put the blame and then continue to be a slave to our circumstances. You know, sometimes it seems to, to be part of the human nature to blame something or someone else for, for the problems that we and, and the misfortunes that, uh, that we have caused in our life. Amen. You know, from the choices that, that we've made, from the things that, that we've done, the decisions that we've made in our life. You know, their decisions that we've made, then they're, then they're on us. They're not on somebody else. Amen. Now, I know a lot of times there's, there's, uh, there's circumstances where there's people that's truly victimized and truly traumatized by others. And, you know, but, but the question is, what do they do with those experiences? What do they do with that? You know, there's many times who, I know that there's a need for healing, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, take away the fact, I guess, that, that, you know, we got choices in life. You know, everything that we do, we have, we have a choice for that. And when, when we do get hurt, when we, when we get uh, cheated on or, or, or cheated in something else, or when we get scammed or we suffer physical or, or emotional abuse or, or harm from others, if, if we turn to God and we choose to trust Him and, and we learn and grow from these negative experiences that we have in our life and we get God's perspective in those situations, then He promises us that He's going to work through every situation that we have and bring it for His good. You see, we can choose to forgive others and, and, and we can have our own mistakes and, and own our own mistakes and make, take responsibility for these things uh, that God has entrusted us with, but we have a God who is, who is faithful to empower us. We have a God who, who desires for us to come to Him and, and ask forgiveness. We have a, a God who, who gives us grace to forgive others and to give us wisdom and, and is waiting to give us what we need in every situation that we have in our life. Right. 
But see, choosing freedom means taking what we have heard from biblical principles and then taking the responsibility of those biblical principles and those decisions in our lives and, and applying that truth to our lives. But see, freedom only comes from my point number two, and that's the importance of understanding our security. You see, if we look at verse 26, Jesus was saying to this religious crowd, he says, you know, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not one of my family. You're not one of my sheep here. And he says in verse 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He, he's telling them that, you know, that the blessings that comes out of this relationship is that his sheep, his people, you know, us as, as God's children, as Christian people, are assured of the security of our salvation and our final redemption and the security of his unfailing love. You see, Jesus said that, that he gives his sheep eternal life. Now, this, this word give that it talks about here in, in this scripture is in the present tense. You see, those who believe in Jesus, you know, we don't have to wonder uh, and, and wait until we get to heaven to know for sure, you know, that we had security in our salvation. We don't have to wait until we draw our last breath here on this earth and open our eyes and, and see heaven and be like, whew, boy, I just didn't know there for a while. You know, I, I just, I was taking a chance on it. You know, this is the security that God gives us. We don't have to wait until that time to wonder if we're going to make it to heaven. Because with Jesus, we can experience that security in our life every day, knowing that He has forgiven us of our sins, and knowing that, that we, are, we have eternal life in and through Him. You know, knowing that He's with us and that He's going to provide for us in our lives every single day, no matter what's happening in our lives and what's going on around us, we can find peace in Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, in verses 28 and 29, Jesus says this. He says, And I give them eternal life, that they, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Amen. See, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. See, what Jesus is saying here is, is that His Father has given Him talking about us, talking about each person in this world, all the Christian people, talking about His children, and, and He's telling Him that we are more precious than anything else that He has ever created on this earth. No one can snatch me out of my Father's hands. No one can snatch you out of His Father's hands, out of Jesus' hands. Not, we can't even snatch ourselves out of His hand. No, He's got total control. Our peace, church, and our security is not found in our financial investments. It's not found in our friends. It's not found in our physical strength. It's not found in the good works that we do uh, every day. It's, not found, it's, it's only found in the all-powerful shepherd Himself, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen? See, that I, I listen to that and I think about that, but there's, you, to me, one of the most precious things about a Christian faith is that we, can hold, that we can hold on to in our daily life is that our eternal life does not depend, depend upon our feeble hold on Christ, but it depends upon the firm grip that Jesus has upon us. You know, He's got a hold of us. Jesus is not saying that we're going to be delivered from all of our earthly disasters and troubles as, as we're Christian people. You see, but when we're saved, no matter what disaster or what trouble that, that we come into and, and what we're going to face in Him, uh, it's, it's Him who's able to work all those things out for us. It's Him who's able to work all those things for our good and to, and to guide us and direct us in all of that. You know, because it's only in Him where we, where we find that rest, where we find that, that and, and understand our security in Him. And we can rest assured that our foundation is secure in the midst of uncertainty because Jesus has not only come, overcome the world, as stated in John 16, 33, but God has told us not to be terrified or worried because He is going to be with us wherever we go. And He says that in Joshua 1, 9. You see, he's, he's with us all the time. He's with us day and night. He's with us all the time. And, and He is the peace in the time of storms. He's the peace and the comforter that we find in, in all the situations in our life when, when we face troubles. He's, he's our strong tower and He's expressing His Father's heart for His sheep here in the Scripture. And He wants you to know this. He wants you, us to experience this security of our salvation and the security of our home in heaven on a daily basis. But we see here in verse 30, 
If we look down there, he, say, he says, I and my Father are one. So Jesus and his Father are one. Jesus was saying that, that he and his Father are one in everything. They're, they're one in power. They're one in purpose. They're, they're one in action. And, and here in this passage, they're one in preventing the theft of any sheep from the divine safekeeping of the hand of God. Amen? You see, he was saying that whoever listens to him will find life, and in that process, they're going to they're gonna gain everything. But the one who refuses to receive his message, the one who, who turns their back against God and, and salvation, you know, they're going to lose everything, including their own life for all of eternity. Because see, outside of Jesus and his word, we have no certainty at all other than death and taxes, you know, that we, we have that true freedom. And that true freedom comes from taking responsibility for the life that God has given to us and taking responsibility for knowing that our life is secure in Christ. So number three takes me to my next point, the, the importance of seeing the obvious. You see, once these religious Jews, when they came to Jesus here, as, as, as talked about and, and started questioning him, we look at verse 32, and it says that they came to him. Uh, let me find it here. It says, Jesus answered them. Well, I'm going to go back and read verse 31. It said, Then the Jews took up stones against him to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you for my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? You see, once these Jews heard these words of Jesus here in, in verse 32 and, and, and preceding those, you know, Jesus tells them, he, he wants to know, he said, what have I done? You know, what, what is it that you're going to stone me for? I do the works of my Father, and I do all these good works. So, so explain to me what it is. What's, what good works are you going to stone me for? Is it for opening the eyes of the blind? You know, maybe for, for, for making the lame to walk? Maybe it's for curing the leper, you know? Which of these miracles are you going to stone me for? You see, they, they were accusing Jesus of being the man who was exalting himself as God in verse 33. They said, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for you for blasphemy and because you being a man make yourself God. You see, they, the, these guys, they completely refused to acknowledge that he was God Almighty. He was the second person of the Trinity who humbled himself to become sin for us and that he became man to come to this world to suffer and to die on that cross for us. And they refused to see that. You see, church, can you imagine that this nation has been waiting? You know, the, these people has been waiting for thousands of years uh, for the Messiah to come. And now here he is. He's standing right in front of their faces. But they couldn't get past their own mindset to see the obvious of who Jesus was. And, and there he was right directly in front of him. Can you imagine how many times Jesus wanted them to see who God truly is and to understand his redemption in their life? And even when they tried to arrest him and kill him, he still called them to come to, the, to him and to be set free from the power of sin and death in their life. He, was, he wasn't concerned about being stoned, church. He was concerned about their souls. You know, and even, even the though that they were who they were, he was still concerned about them. He, he pleads with them here to believe in him because he knew that, that what their end would be if they refused, and that's eternity in hell. And he didn't want to see that for them. Jesus said, you ask me if I am the Christ. And he says, it should be clear to you who I am. It should be clear to you, but you, you wouldn't examine the evidence or acknowledge the obvious by looking at the works of the things that I've done. You know, you completely missed out on it. You know, it's kind of like somebody who's, who, who's coming to church every week and all they've got is religion. You know, they've missed the person of Jesus Christ completely. You know, it, it, it wasn't here in the scripture, though. It wasn't that Jesus, you know, rejected them, but they ultimately rejected him. You know, the Savior of the world. But see, the irony of this story is that while they were celebrating this, this feast of dedication, uh, which pointed to their future freedom, they wanted to stone the very person, the very one that came to set them free from their own blindness and their own oppression. You know, they, they, they just couldn't see what was directly in front of him. And see, as God's children, even though we've been set free from the power of sin and death, there's still many things that God wants us 
to be set free from to, that affect our physical, our emotional, our, our spiritual, and our relation, relational well-being. But see, the often the problem is, is very clear. You know, it's got a clear answer, it's, and it's right here in, our, in the Word of God. You know, we can find it. It's right in front of our face. If we'll just open the Word and, and dig into it and read it, He'll speak to us, and, and He'll show us what the answer is. You know, the question is, are we willing to accept that? Are we willing to accept the answer that, that God gives us? Are we secure enough in God's love and His promises in our lives? Are we willing to see and to receive the answer to our questions from God's perspective? You know, sometimes the problems are, are very obvious and the answers are very clear. You know, I, I thought about, you know, I, I don't sleep well when the moon's fixing to be full and this week has already started off. I know the moon's, and I was talking about this on, on the way here, I was... I was sitting out walking around outside about 1 o'clock this morning because I just couldn't sleep. And it was 71 degrees at 1 o'clock this morning. It felt really good. So I enjoyed I sat out on the patio for a little bit. But, you know, it, 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 it's, it's times like that where, you know, to where I complain during the day. You know, I'd say, man, I'm, I'm tired. I didn't get enough sleep last night. Well, the only answer to that is get more sleep. Go to bed earlier. Get more rest. I stay hungry all the time. You know, I, I've got to work for some reason. I don't know if I've got a tapeworm or what, but I've, it's like I'll eat a full-course meal at breakfast, and I'll eat, I'm talking like a stack of three pancakes and four or five eggs and some bacon and stuff, and do that about 8 o'clock, by 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and, and they make fun of me. They're like, well, you know, maybe he's probably hungry, and I'm usually hungry. You know, I, I eat like a horse all the time, but, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten yet. Well, the answer is pretty simple. Get something to eat. You know, and that's the way it is. Sometimes the problem is just obvious and it's very clear, but sometimes you have to make the hard decisions to, to do the right things, like, like eating well or build margins in your schedule to get the nourishment or the rest that we need in our lives to, to live a balanced life. You know, we, we, we look at life, church, as a sprint. We do. We're, people are busy all the time. We're always running from here to there and, and, and going somewhere all the time. And, and we've, we've got to slow down and realize this life is a marathon. You know, it's not, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. We, we, we need to learn to pace ourselves for the long journey that we have uh, before us. Uh, I read a story about a professor at the Applied Administrative Sciences Building in Berlin, and he conducted a study on the relationship between choices and, and freedom, and he did that from a psychological standpoint. And I thought it was a pretty interesting read. Uh, this study revealed that when it comes to making decisions, even, even if it's a very difficult decision that, that we have to make, people become more likely to experience inner freedom and, and inner peace when they know that their decision is going to lead to a positive or desired outcome. You know, and that's amazing. You know, even though the answer is clear, at times making the right choice is not always the easy one because there's always a cost involved with it. You know, it, it's, it just happens. But, you know, we, we want to make those decisions that are going to lead to those positive and desired outcomes in our lives. And those decisions should be the ones that we make in our life that's going to bring honor and glory to God. You know, every, everything that we do, you know, God has given us all the practical wisdom that we need uh, to live a good godly life. And we just need to take it and apply it in total dependency upon the one who gave it to us. And so as we learn to make the right choices, no matter how hard or how challenging they might be, we want to make choices that honor God and, and choices that are going to accomplish His will for our lives. And when we do, it'll bring healing and it'll bring free, freedom into the life that God has created for each one of us. So, you know, when we, when we think about the next time a, a hard time comes up in our life, you think about even Jesus while he was here on this earth for those 33 years. You know, you think about uh, all the times that he had to put up with people coming and interrogating him. You, you think about all the stuff that he had to go through. You know, and, and, and we look back on his life and... You know, I, I was reading through uh, the scriptures this week about, you know, the week that he's coming up, that, you know, that the Easter week is. And, and I look at each day, you know, like where he was at in that day, what they think he was doing and, and where he was at and all. You know, I think about all the things that he went through that week. You know, I, I, and I preached last Sunday, uh, I preached on some scripture and I, and I was asking the question, you know, talking about, 
You know, here uh, Friday was, it was, or Sunday was Palm Sunday, and everybody was excited for Jesus to be riding in on this colt into Jerusalem. You know, they were, they were laying their clothes down, and they were cutting palm branches and laying them down at his feet, and, you know, and, and everybody was shouting Hosanna to him. Over two million people in Jerusalem at that time, you know, and, and, and they were excited for him to be there. But then you think about that from Sunday to Friday. It, it, was the, it was the majority of those very same people who were shouting Hosanna and welcoming him on Sunday. It was those very same people who were shouting crucify him on Friday. You know, we have to think about that, church. We, you know, we, we have to make sure that the things that we do in our lives are, are the things that are going to bring honor and glory to God. So let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I'm just thankful for uh, the night and the opportunity to be able to come to your house.